a good afternoon for everyone. Uh, uh, sorry about the delay. We were just fixing some issues because I, I want to kind of have access to my uh, computer so I can show what uh, uh, the, the hands-on part. So basically, uh, yeah, my name is Leandro Parente. I'm from research at OpenGeoHub. And today I will be talking about this kind of trendy name that <laughs> I put this geo out to ML. So I will try to split the con the concept during the and explain part by part during the presentation using this library, the scikit-map that we are basically using during the the uh, the project development. So I put uh, the materials in the Mattermost. So you also have access through the through the uh, slides using this short URL and the QR code. So you should be able to access and, and kind of uh, reproduce everything that I'm I'm explaining here. So basically today, yeah, I will that's basically the outline of, of the workshop. So I will explain basically the challenges of machine learning applied to a spatial prediction. So it's basically use machine learning to generate maps. So and and so basically why uh, uh, and how we can do that, and also some optimization strategies that we implemented in the uh, at OpenGeoHub and also in the context of the uh, Open Earth Monitor uh, project. So I will link that with some use case and give some introduction about this AutoML. Uh, it's kind of a trendy term, more like related to computer science science, but also like some uh, development community. Explain the hands-on demonstration and also what I mean with this geo auto ML and what are the possibilities considering all these uh, technologies and how we can use that really together and combine it to produce better results. So, and when we talk about machine learning, um, so yeah, you can have different pipelines and, and, and in general this part here in the center, it's more like related to the machine learning. Uh, so you probably will see in every kind of in different kinds of domain, but uh, specifically for the spatial prediction, we need to have mainly uh, these two inputs, right? Training samples, ground truth points, reference data. Can be polygons also, but most of the time it's poly uh, it's in situ data. So this training data, so land cover samples, tree species, biodiversity uh, points, and, and 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 things like that. And and to produce spatial predictions, basically you need to have like a, a raster data, gridded uh, data. So we here I'm referring to it as Arco data sets. So analysis ready and cloud optimized uh, data sets because uh, in this way we can visualize and, and, and also run uh, data analytics on top of that. So, and basically we, we, we have this approach to basically combine the points with the raster data. So you have this overlay, right? You have a point and you get some raster value and you can build basically a classification or a regression matrix. And with that, you can start the machine learning uh, pipeline. So I, in the hands-on, I will basically show uh, example of a uh, uh, regression matrix to model like a uh, PAPAR variable. And you can see in practice how it, it looks like. It's, it's nothing special. You, you have different formats, so you can save as Parquet, but can be a CSV. But the most important, you really need to have this space time or only spatial overlay that matches the pixel value with the points. So in the machine learning pipe, pipeline you have different ways to do but in general what we do it's hyperparameter uh, tuning and uh, feature selection and we can test the model and you have the machine learning training and in the end you have a model that you can really apply to the data so and so you can spend a lot of time doing this so this requires more like uh, kind of work considering uh, some um, exploratory work and code and things like that but on a computation side, uh, when depending on what you are actually predicting and the, 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 the output that you want to do, actually most of the, the time will be in the prediction. So for example, if you want to produce some product at global scale or 30 meter for the whole uh, Europe, so some continental data set, the prediction time will basically might run for days depending on your infrastructure. 
So, but it's basically two mod moments. You have a moment to optimize the model, and other moment really to go for the production and apply this model for every single pixel of your uh, an study area. And this study area can be like global scale, national scale, continental scale, and of course it depends also the spatial resolution and the time. So in the project, in the OMC, basically uh, we are uh, working to create a kind of seamless catalog where we can serve all these data. So for example, the in-situ data, but also the ARCO data sets. So and in, in, in the morning I presented like in uh, in, in my talk, I, I presented some of these ARCO data sets that we organized it for the land use and land cover products, so it will be available in stack. But the most important is we, we are really relying and taking advantage 100% uh, in, in these uh, mostly cloud-optimized geotiffs, so we actually build a single mosaic for all the entire area. So even in, in the morning I show even there is a word cover 10 meter produced with Sentinel. You can build a single mosaic and just off you go, you have overviews, you can load it directly in different solutions, and, and, and we think that's a, a kind of a very flexible and, and, and scalable solution. So, and as I said, most of the, when you have this running, uh, uh, the pipeline done, you, you build like a machine learning model, and you want to go for prediction, uh, and if, you, if we are talking about really large amounts of data, the most of the computation cost will be on the prediction. And, and, and this is a bit different. Some other domains, they may have like more computation cost on the training data, but because we are talking about like earth observation data, gridded data sets, it's really huge, the amount of pixels that, that we need to process. So, but, so, and, and if you really want to optimize that, and, and of course this is the, the computation cost, uh, we need to, to realize that, so basically, when you have a model ready to go and you want to send this for, for, for predictions and to produce mapping outputs, you mainly have like these three operations, right? So you need to read the data. So for example, if you are doing some prediction for the whole world, probably for sure you'll not read the whole world because it will not fit, for example, in some uh, memory. Even if you have like some cluster, the data needs to be, of course, distributed and, and, and located in a very specific memory position, right? So you, you might do it by tiling, but basically you need to read the data, run the prediction, and, and write the, the data back. So basically the output here. So, and if you think about that, of course, the data reading and data writing, it's basically IO bound, right? So it's mostly dependent of the network, uh, where the data is hosted and where the data is stored. But talking about uh, like really, uh, raster data, we also have the component of the compression. So for example, when you talk about cloud optimized GeoTIFF, ZAR files, most of these files, they have uh, loss, uh, like they, they have this compression algorithms that actually takes advantage of CPU. So if you have some parallel reading, you can even boost a bit this IO, even if this process is IO bound, you can really read in parallel and tune a bit this part of the pipeline just taking advantage of uh, more CPU because the compression algorithm will use some of the CPU. And when you go for prediction, it's basically CPU bound, right? So uh, it depends of how much cores you have, what is your infrastructure, and, and, and the speed of uh, uh, CPUs and things like that, or GPUs. So considering these two possibilities, uh, we can think about some optimization strategies, right? So what exactly you can do and in practice you can do to really speed up and increase the data reading and saving speed. So uh, the most obvious thing is actually improve the hardware, right? If you have the images stored, for example, in an SSD disk, it will be better than a, a, a hard drives, right? And if you have some uh, like solution that the data is distributed across multiple servers, we also need to think about uh, increase the, the network speed, right? And the, the, uh, you can move, for example, for uh, kind of other protocols. So for example, if you use uh, infinite band, it's actually 40 times faster than a regular ethernet connection. So, but it's strictly hardware, right? So you can improve the hardware. You can move for like some faster software storage solution, some distributed file system or some S3 instead to use some kind of old fashioned protocol and just sharing uh, like uh, data across multiple servers. You have now pretty, 
uh, plenty of solutions to do that, like Ceph. Uh, we at OpenGeo Hub, we particularly use like COE DFS. So if the data is in the cloud, of course, you can rely on some S3 service uh, as AWS or Google Cloud Storage. So y there are some options. And so on the software rise, of course, you can have a more efficient IO prioritization. So using thread based or low overhead. So basically, for example, depending on your technology, you can move part of this pipeline for, for some uh, basic C++ or I even like more efficient memory management, right? So, and, and, and here is really like work with pre-allocation uh, of memory or zero copying and depending on the way that you are doing stuff, this is really can, can, can boost the, 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 the speed. So yeah, you can work with all of that, but this is specific for data reading and saving. And of course, if we are predicting like large amounts of pixels, that might make a lot of difference. We are talking about like, you can reduce by days the computation time and the time to really produce the, 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 the final map. So you can also work in reduce the prediction time, right? So, and for reduce the prediction time, again, more hardware. This is kind of a bit more easy if you just have more servers around. So if you are in the cloud, you can just hire more servers and scale your process. Of course, you need to have a code to support that, some platform, or if you have an in-house infrastructure, you can just expand also the servers. Uh, one thing that we started using um, less than one year ago, it's basically compiled machine learning models. I will talk more about that. And this is very nice because you can do all the development, for example, in Python or in R, for example. For example. But once you have the model, we can really compile that for a more uh, optimized uh, version that will run in C++. And this is speeds up a lot the, the prediction time. And one thing that we also we started implemented like less than one year ago is if you are doing multi-year predictions, so you are basically predicting all the years between 2000 and 2020, you can put all the years in the memory and allocate all the memory to predict the whole time series at once. So you avoid the overhead, for example, to uh, like warping and, and, and shaping this data in the proper format to feed some machine learning model. So specific about the compiled models, you have basically three solutions that you can work in practice. So this solution we are using now, this TL2C gen, it's a terrible name. It's very difficult to find. I still don't memorize it yet. So I keep the links all around, but uh, that's a very nice solution that basically converts uh, uh, a decision tree in a kind of uh, uh, C++ code. I will show in practice how it looks like. So this, I found just one, one or two weeks ago, this leaves. It's basically like uh, also a compile uh, mechanism for gradient descendant trees. So basically, you can compile live GBM, XGBoost, and it, it speeds up about 10 times the prediction time. And the Hummingbird is fun it's financed, funded by the, the Microsoft, and you can also convert machine learning uh, uh, models from scikit-learn, but also like an, uh, like really deep learning algorithms, also some TensorFlow or Keras. So uh, basically, uh, these are there are other solutions, but th these are basically the ones that I would recommend because I basically tested the three of them. So, and what we are trying to do in the scikit map, we are working hard actually to tackle these problems, right? So, implement an efficient IO parallelization, basically go into C++ to do that efficient memory management in a transparent way, and 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 so where we can develop, do the pipeline, implement it, and once we want to move for production, we can compile the models and also organize the data in a multi-year prediction. So, uh, now the develop it's basically running multiple branches, but we are working to actually merge it and, and starting document all the functionalities. Now we are in this phase. And, and all these ideas and things that I'm, I'm putting here, we actually tested it in practice. So specific about the, the, the TL2C gen, that's what happens. So basically when you train a model with a random forest, you have like uh, several trees where you have a bunch of decisions. And at e every single node, it's basically one decision considering one of the variable. And what this library does, it's basically, it converts it for a huge C++ code, a bunch of if-else, and compiles it with uh, Intel C++ compiler or like a GCC. And once you do that, you actually optimize all the structure to runs in, in, in a way that 
you will take full advantage of the low level instructions of the, the CPU. So, and if you are running a CPU with like an Intel environment, if you use the, the, the CPU, the compiler from the Intel, you actually, you boost two times. So it's, it's very uh, nice solution. And, and so, but that's kind of the, the idea. You have other strategies to do that, but it's specific for decision tree. So I think, yeah, this is a kind of old idea, but works quite well. So, uh, so during the OpenGL hack, I actually went really to all the nasty details to explain how we are implementing all these things in an in a operational way, right? So you can find the talk here, uh, but I basically explain how I compiled that, how, how we organized all the data, and you can see it online. So, so and the link is available. Uh, so in the context of the OMC, basically we are uh, connected with all these use cases, so all so these predictions and the scikit map is basically used to produce, for example, crop yield mo and monitoring systems for Africa, the global monitoring system for livestock and, and, and grassland and pastures within the context of the global pasture watch, but also the EU soil observatory, like a uh, farm alert system, so also some soil uh, predictions, and you can see the whole list of the use cases here in, in the in the bottom, right? So. And so we actually tested this to produce the, this cultivated grassland and natural and semi-natural grassland product. So we have a publication that it's under uh, review now. And, and basically, yeah, that's the, the so, so you here it's more like about the method, I will not explain it, but just to, sh to say that this, this, it's actually we are putting it in practice. Okay, so, but this is basically how we are doing producing maps today, right? So, and, so how we can take advantage, for example, of this, this concept, right, this AutoML. So first we need to think what is AutoML. So basically uh, that's the best definition that I could find. So it's, it's basically automated machine learning, right? It's a reduction, but so regardless, if you are building like classifier training regressions, it's, it's basically a generalized search concept uh, where you, with you can really search algorithms to find optimal solutions for every component of that machine learning pipeline that I show, but doing it in a very kind of, of course, automated way. Uh, so with some uh, uh, decisions that of course were uh, implemented or made in some uh, existing pipeline. And I will show how it will kind of really work in practice. So, and when you think about this uh, AutoML systems, it's, it's not a very, new idea, I think it's almost 10 years uh, ago, but basically you have training data and you basically you need to do, to do like data preprocessing, feature generation, feature enhancing, some, some machine learning uh, and, and model hyperparameter and, and you, sh you should define like what, what algorithm you can use, right? So, and, and so all these decisions, you can really try to automate that and you have frameworks to, to actually do it. There are actually plenty of frameworks, I think more than 20. So I, I actually tested this tree, and the, the for me the best one is this EVO, uh, EML. So, and, and you, you have other, at least more 10 of them in this link. But this EVO ML for me, it's, it's a more robust, you have a very nice documentation, and it does like things really automatically, and you have support also to model understanding. So basically, you can optimize, evaluate machine learning pipelines, several pipelines. So you can produce in like also some objective uh, specific metrics and, and, and have some specific rules for, for optimization. So, and it, you, it's, yeah, you have plenty of functionalities here. I will just show some very uh, brief and uh, hands-on demonstration. So what I did, you can find the, the code here uh, it's basically in this notebook, uh, but uh, because the idea really is really run things out. So I put the, the notebook also here in this uh, Google Colab. So if you want to run, you can uh, just access it the directly the, the presentation. I put it in the Mattermost. I see some people connected. And just go to the uh, Google Colab. So I shared the, this this notebook uh, with um, so with anyone with the link can see as a commenter. 
but let me let me know if it, it's possible to access so let me increase the font here so yeah we can do like this maybe it's it's less so and and the google collab it's basically google drive for notebooks right so that's exactly what it is the notebook it's actually the google drive so what you can do is not you can do really need to do is you need to make a copy of that because otherwise everyone will work in the same uh, notebook and you can't uh, really edit so and basically you go here and you create a copy of this so you can actually execute uh, the data so yeah it's creating some a copy you see uh, okay so and now yeah so so the so there are some instructions here I will just go and explain like step by step so because but this is okay let's open this in a new tab now it's done took some time okay here yeah now I have a copy of that I can go so and in the Google Colab basically uh, it's very similar to a to its notebook right so because we will use the scikit-map and this eval ml you really need to install them here because they are not here by standard right by, the by default so you can just go here type this or shift enter and it will install in the library so the scikit-map will get the last version for the uh, the, the main branch and yeah it's it's installing it and and after that while it's installing i can uh, starting explaining what we will do so basically in this uh, workshop we work with the data that we use it in the hackathon so last year we organized a hackathon this global fapar modeling so basically here you already have like a documentation for the the, the variables and and how the regression matrix look like and the problem here is basically model like photosynthetic active uh, a fraction of active uh, photosynthetic uh, radiation so FAPAR and and basically this is like a, a data from ground station and and here it's already organized so you don't need to do any cleaning it's just go straight for the modeling but I recently added also like a uh, raster data so here you can see like a raster data where we will download so we can effectively predict by the I don't know in 10 minutes we can s predict the FAPAR uh, using uh, the best model that we will find with the auto ML so let me go here so it's installing out this this guy takes some time to install so because it's yeah this is basically encapsulate several other libraries of uh, uh, machine learning Python so it will install XGBoost if it doesn't have so some light GBM because it will test most of the common by default it will test most of the common uh, machine learning libraries so and now let's just skip all these uh, things here and if you are in the collab this is something that it's really necessary you need to restart the session so that's why I uh, put it here let yeah let's just see I don't want to clean the runtime otherwise I need to install it again so it's yeah it's just restarting the session and now uh, we can use uh, the the library uh, that we installed so first thing is here it's because it's collab right the data it's not here so we really need to go to Zenodo and download the data so and you can see now we downloaded the training data it's basically a CSV file so this works for some demonstration but if you really work with production you know you have like thousands uh, of lines and, and some you can have literally like millions of uh, training data input right rows so it, it's better to move for some uh, like more optimized format as part kit and and here I'm downloading also the raster data and and we can uh, so basically it will download and extract it we will work with that only in the in the end and let me see if I can clear all the where clear all the uh, clear all outputs fine so okay so first 
let's read the training data. So basically, you can see here it's 32 uh, columns, uh, about 3,000 uh, and 3,000 3, lines. So and it's basically uh, you can just look at it right. It's not special. We will show all the columns, and you can uh, just visualize. It's fine. So let's see all the columns that we have. So basically, we have sample ID, station, month, PAPAR value, and like several covariates that we have also as raster data. So for all these covariates, we have the description in Zenodo, but it's mostly Moji's data, like some yearly water vapor, monthly water vapor, several DTM variables, accumulated monthly precipitation. So I put a descriptive name. Uh, but uh, you have the documentation in the Zenodo uh, information, uh, in the Zenodo uh, book. Yeah, these are points. And this is actually from GBOP, I think. So there is this uh, Copernicus FAPAR uh, data, and we used that, but we didn't mention the hackathon because we were not, we, we, we tried to hide in the location uh, to avoid some uh, shitting right in the, <laughs> in the hackathon. But yeah, this is actually uh, from Copernicus. So, and, and basically, how this it looks like? So you can see here basically all the stations that uh, and and for all the stations we have more uh, like multiple observations, and it's organized for every observation we have the month. So we kind of organized it also for monthly. So it's basically monthly FAPAR values for every station, but it's not organized in a time series format. Every monthly observation, it's a kind of independent in this model. So, uh, but of course, if you have the station, you can build the time series and work with some time series model, but it will reduce a lot the, the training data because it will be basically the, the number of stations that we have. So, and what we can do here is basically when we do, so if you check the columns, right, we can just get all the columns that are from this position, four, and I will just call this like covariates or features. We have the FA par, and I will just keep the station as some sort of group for the, the validation. So I'm calling here this CV group. It's basically essentially how we use this spatial cross validation. So we avoid to validate the, the, the training data with the, 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 the same station. So we remove all the stations during the validation. And that's exactly what we are doing here. So for early stopping, so basically to have like some I'm calling here calibration, but during the optimization process, I will keep some independent data to really assess the accuracy. And here it's the R square. And I'm keeping like 621 uh, points outside, but this is basically 20% of the stations. So I take completely one station and I, I don't touch it. And I use that also for validate. This is actually to assess the, the if the model is it's really gen generic, right? So we if we can generalize it. So one thing that I, I found that it's really cool is this. So here in this eval ML that we are using, they have a lot of data checks. So and this is pretty useful uh, for 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 this phase because, of course, when we did all this overlay and we produced that, there was some several there were actually several points that were empty because of some uh, gap in the covariate. So in here you can see there is this. Uh, so of course it will not show any uh, data as NA, but you can simulate some gaps here and see how it looks like. So I will not do it, but there you have this new data check. So basically you can see which columns you have like NA and which how many rows, and you can have some constraints here to uh, select decide if you will ignore it or not. And here they have plenty of data checks. And another one that is quite uh, useful for regression it's basically this target distribution data check, right? So basically here you can see the data, it's log normal distribution according to the, to the library. And depending on this, you, you might apply some transformation or might be suitable for other uh, algorithms and things like that. So if you check the data set, it's mostly like this. This is the, the distribution of the target variable. And here is the, the, the FAPAR, right? Change from zero to one. And now I can explain most of these zero points actually we added in kind of desert areas to kind of try to confuse a bit the, the, the participants in the hackathon. So we kind of data augmented that uh, in a way that it's, it's possible to, 
let's say that there, there's no FAPAR la there because of the lack of vegetation, right? And if you're just plotting log scale, you can see a bit better the, the distribution. So regarding the automated part, automated machine learning part, so basically, so you have plenty of uh, parameters, and of course I will just explain a few of them. Here it's you have a very comprehensive guide where all these parts are explained and things like that. So what I try to do here is it's really minimize the number of parameters. So we have training data here, the calibration data that we isolated, 20% of the stations, uh, they call this holdout. holdout. They will in, the, in, the lab, in the package, it use it to evaluate the early stop. Here you have a problem type, but this is interesting because I don't need to specify the problem type. So there is a function to do that, right? So I don't even, for me, if I had like a classification problem here, it, it would probably, uh, it, it will I can literally use exactly the same code and it will be optimized for classification. So because I just say, yeah, here's my target variable, figure out what kind of this problem. It's, it's not a big thing, but it's there and it's, it's kind of cool. Um, so there is this optimized uh, thresholds for some uh, 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 for, for the, the searching of the parameters. And this is the kind of the most important uh, parameter. You it's basically how many iterations it, it will run. So and in this case, I'm just putting 10. It's this actually it's running now in the collab, but I tested it in a notebook. It runs fine. So if you want to really test, you can put 100 here or you can say you can run for 10 minutes and just stop and give me the best result. So, and basically, yeah, that's everything that you need to run. And the class that will do the magic is basically this AutoML search. And, and you set the parameters here, and, and I use this interactive plot. And here you can see how the R square changes uh, from uh, every iteration. So there's plenty of log information here, which algorithms it will test and things like that. But we will have a summary in the end. No, no, it's, it's it, the, uh, so they, it has the, you need to specify the problem type, but they have a function to detect the problem type. <laughs> so if it's classification, you can really, so I think yeah, binary problems, like binary classification, uh, regression, multi-class classification, kind of regular stuff. I'm not sure, so, uh, um, but that's a good point. Maybe, maybe it, it, it can, but I'm, I'm not sure. So yeah, it's can running it here. Can it detect it's a spatial or spatial temporal? No, this thing, no. So here we are just uh, addressing it in the data preparation, right? So, the but, the but the it has- The most generic actually. Yeah, but it has some time series mm -hmm. algorithms. So, and for time series, I, I didn't test, but we could convert this data for time series and we can optimize for time series. So yeah, we have this, so all several uh, outputs here, I will not pass through it, but you can have a rank, right? And in the rank, you can really, I can just minimize this and here. Yeah, ah, here. So you can see, so that's the ranking score. I didn't, I didn't define the rank, so it used R squared by default. You can see in the, in the, in the cross validation here. So, and basically it ranks all the possibilities. So it uses some random forest regressor with some specific parameters. It's doing some imputation if the data is new, it has an A, we don't need that. And it's doing also some select collection. I will explain it. But it tested against XGBoost, LightGBM, extra trees, elastic net, and this mean baseline that it's probably some very dumb uh, algorithm, just really a baseline. So, and uh, of course we can go crazy here and just test it things, but these again, these are kind of the full pipelines. We can define our own pipelines that maybe will make more sense for uh, remote sensing and earth observation problems, right? So, and what, what is happening is basically now I can describe what is the winner. So I just take here and say, okay, who won this uh, best model? So there are several statistics here, but in the end, yeah, that's the, the name. So Rangoon Forest Regressor with Inputter and Select Column Transformer. So this is a kind of predefined pipeline that it's already there, ready to go. And, and it's, it's more like for a demonstration purpose, if you move this for production, we really need to kind of think up best about this pipeline. 
So, but it, what is interesting is we can now get this, okay, let's get the best pipeline and let's do some model understanding, right? And they also have several tools for model understanding. So you can see variable importance and permutation and things like that. So here, for example, this is the variable importance. So, and it's basically, yeah, mode is red, right? The red band, it's the most important. Blue, it's MIR, NDVI, and, and after that, the DTM stuff. So, and you can plot or have it in a table format. So, but it also has this kind of interesting permutation importance. So as far as I understood here, it kind of mess it up with one of the variables to see if it will impact in the, in the, in the classification. So for example, here, if you um, kind of change and create some randoms or noise in the modes uh, red, it will impact a lot as expected. And some of them, if you kind of mess it up, so if you just put some noise, it actually increase. <laughs> so it means that this variable is close to kind of random variable for the model. So, and, and that's a kind of two metrics that are there. But okay, so now we have a model. We could, I, I will not show how to save that, but we can say, we could save that and load for other moment. But here I will just move for prediction uh, straight away. So, an important point is, of course, for the prediction, all the columns that I show in the table, we need to have like a raster data for that, right? In the table, it was actually one pixel, but for raster data, I need to have like a proper image. And the data, it's kind of already prepared to, to with the na same names. So basically here, I'm basically matching the names of the tables, of the columns with the, the, the uh, um, uh, file names. So it's literally the same. That's not always the case, so it requires also some coding effort to do it. The other thing is this model, it's kind of time agnostic. So I can use the same model to predict June, to predict January, to predict August, it doesn't matter, or different year. So what I'm doing here in this data set, I only have 2020, but I have multiple months. So I will predict June. So here I'm just loading all the data from June, some static variables. So actually here I'm just preparing the, the raster uh, file names, and here I'm actually uh, reading uh, the data. So we having this scikit-map function, like just read the data, and now we have like a, so it's not a big area, but we have 32 covariates, and we just converted this for a data frame, so to make it able to really run in the in the in the framework. So okay, and basically now that I can run, I can basically get basically the best pipeline and just send it to predict. And, and after that, I, I need to do some reshaping with the data, of course, uh, and I'm rescaling it for zero to 100 because the model was zero to one. So in here I have an output, right? So, but to take a look in this output, we can use this plot raster. And this is a region in um, Amazon. This is a area in the Amazon region. So this is a kind of a, a national, it's a kind of indigenous reserve. So here is like some uh, kind of pasture areas and, and here's also like some uh, water and, and river. And, and basically I will download and we can check this data, how it looks like. But this is actually the FAPAR for the month uh, June, for, for June, right? So, and we can just go and predict all the, all the months. So, and with that, we can also use this, the, the save raster functions for the, the scikit-map, and it will basically save the file using the same pixel size, the same spatial resolution, extend, and things like that. Here, I'm just tweak a bit to change the node data and things like that, but that's not a big issue. So, and, and basically, you go here, you can download uh, the data. You just open the CoinGIS, so I will download here. And yeah, it's not a big file. Uh, it's it's a small area, but I I could just go and 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 run like for all, all the months, and I would have like a time series of uh, papar. Let me see where is my coin Yes. Uh, okay. So and now. Okay. Basically, I can plot this on top of Google. Yeah. And 
that's basically the how the yeah that's like a pretty simple but the thing here is of course this is just like some kind of demonstration right but we can we can evolve this right and, and this is of course it's also good to have some you can see the pixel values here in the bottom but this is good for a starting point so we can test it and 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 uh, like test other probes and things like that so it's it's a again it's a good starting point D did you do also feature selection automatically no it they do everything yeah they but do but not by default though no i think so depends of the pipeline so you oh. can apply it uh, the the thing is when you do feature selection in practice i most of these pipelines they do the feature selection but you still need to read all the data so it's a bit useless you lose time in the reading time so in general what we do is we do the feature selection and we just try to read the the, the features that were selected right so and here, I, this thing, I'm, I'm not sure how they manage, but that's that's uh, uh, something that we need to be aware. Okay, so let me just move to the final part. Uh, is there a, a plot of diagnostics that you you can plot the so you you know you fit the model and everything and just want just to see the like a accuracy plot or something? Yeah, you have this in the just in the ranking. So like here, you have some diagnostics, so they are square, they're explainable. Uh, Max or and they tested it for different uh, data size, but it's kind of the same information that we have in this ranking. So, ranking score, holdout, cross validation score, and things like that. So, they they provide plenty of uh, metrics here, mm uh, yeah. and this is for all the models that were tested. But like accuracy plot, you will have to make a code, right? No, I think they also have. I'm okay. not. I need to see, but I think I think they have. Okay. So let me just move to the final part. Okay, so basically what I show here is AutoML applied to, 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 to spatial predictions, right? So you can basically go and, and do that, of course. Uh, but you need to have, s so it's important to have some key points in mind. So can we really use this kind of toy example that I show here to produce large scale global continental predictions in a production environment, right? That's kind of, for me, that's the main question. So we can always show some, showcase some of these frameworks and things like that. So, and I do see several uh, issues with, for example, this imputation that we don't use too much uh, in the machine learning way. So we really need to think about that. So, and the way that so, and here's an example, right? So the grassland map that I show, so basically we predicted like 30 meter global scale from 2000 to 2022. It was about uh, one week of computation, like more than 1000 CPU threads. So, and a lot of RAM and things like that, but we work it hard to optimize this pipeline. And, and when you go for some auto MS solution, you need to see if it will fit properly for like production work. So, but I think it could be possible, and I think that's what, uh, for, for me, these are basically the main takeaways if we really want to apply this for a geo auto ML uh, framework, right? So one thing that it's kind of very common and we basically use for different models, it's uh, kind of feature engineering, right? So we have, for example, Sentinel data or Landsat data, but other data sets, they also, they, they have kind of similar spectral bands and, and we could compute, for example, some automated spectral indices. And we have these awesome spectral indices. You have literally hundreds of spectral indices here and we can au easily automate that. So you just provide the raw data and we expand this and really go for a massive feature engineering and expand it to test and do some feature selection. But also some temporal aggregation. So all of this we kind of do in a, offline way right we do it before the modeling but we can embed this in the in the in the in the in a library and that's one way to go the other thing is so when you have like several of these in situ reference data in the, so they they in the real world applications they prob they are mostly clustered because it depends of data availability we will not have like a lucas it's quite the exception right so if you really want to model for example three species or you, depending of, uh, you, you just have the data, you just get the data that is available, you, you, the data will be clustered, so you need to address that. And basically the way that we do is with this spatial cross-validation to avoid some 
overfitting and, 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 and problems with, the, with, with these uh, things. So, and for me, that's kind of the most important thing. So we really need to have a more kind of pragmatic hyperparameter optimization. So it means that when you apply the AutoML, you need to consider some budget for prediction time, right? You can't have like a model. Maybe if you have a model that you increase 0.1%, 0 uh, it will be basically like, a, a, and you explode your prediction time. So this, this approach should really considering some budget, how much computation you have to do it, considering cost, considering time, but also target is statistically significant accuracy improvement, right? You don't want to triple the computation time for maybe 0.1% or maybe yes. So you need to balance these things. But the idea is really have some kind of uh, this implement in implemented in in inside of the, the, the scikit map, at least as a kind of proof of concept to, to kind of uh, expand this concept for, for different uh, applications inside of the OMC project. Yeah, and, and here I finish my presentation. Thank you. Thank you.